I have now assembled the trio of Adafruit RP2040 boards. In front of me, I have the Adafruit Cutie Pie RP2040, Itsy Bitsy RP2040, and finally the Feather RP2040. And today we will be reviewing specifically the Itsy Bitsy RP2040. As the middle child of the lineup, it is aimed at projects that need a small form factor, but a bit more GPIO than the Cutie Pie RP2040 offers. Hello and welcome to a Learn Embedded Systems board review. If you would like to keep up to date with new microcontrollers and boards, then make sure to subscribe as we have loads more of these on the way. I will have links to our reviews of the other Adafruit boards in the description if you are interested in them. So let's look at how the Itsy Bitsy RP2040 sits in this lineup. In terms of price, the Itsy Bitsy costs 9.95 from Adafruit themselves, or for UK viewers, it has been sold at the Pi Hut for £8.70. And I believe at time of writing, Pi Moroni has some deals for Black Friday on this board. I'll put these links down in the description. The Cutie Pi RP2040 comes in at the same price, 9.95, and the feather is a little bit more expensive at 11.95, but it does come with a few more features like LiPo charging functionality. In terms of dimensions, the Itsy Bitsy also sits in the middle at 36mm by 18mm. The Cutie Pie comes in at 21.8mm by 17.8mm, and the feather is quite a bit larger at 50.8mm by 22.8mm. In terms of height or thickness, the Itsy Bitsy is marginally slimmer than both the Cutie Pie and the Feather due to the single sided board and the slimmer micro USB connector when compared to the USB C's on the other ports. So let's take a closer look at the Itsy Bitsy RP2040 and starting with the RP2040 chip that powers this board. The RP2040 chip was designed by the Raspberry Pi Foundation. We have featured this chip pretty heavily on this channel, but for those unfamiliar, let's just quickly go over its key specs. The RP2040 is a dual core ARM Cortex M0 Plus running at 133 MHz stock. It has 264 kilobytes of SRAM and two SPI, I2C and UART controllers. It also has four analog to digital converters, or more specifically, it has, it has four analog to digital inputs that are then muxed or essentially switched between one analog to digital converter. It has eight PIO state machines, USB 1.1 host and device support, and 16 PWM channels. Supporting the RP2040, we have eight megabytes of external flash, which should be enough for most projects. There are two LEDs, a red user LED on GPIO pin 11, which can be used as an indicator in your programs. And there is also an RGB NeoPixel with its power pin tied to a GPIO pin, which means you can disable it to conserve power if you wish. It is not being run all the time. There is no specific power LED unless you write one in your programs and use the red LED for that. I would have liked a power indicator LED as the amount of time that this sort of LED has saved me whilst troubleshooting is quite embarrassing. There are two buttons, a boot select and a reset button. You can hold down the boot select button and press the reset button to load up the bootloader and copy and paste code across. Programming this board is the same as any RP2040 board and you can use the VS Code workflow that I've shown in our previous video, which I'll link in the cards above. In terms of the pinout, there are six power pins and a micro USB connector. This board can be powered over USB or battery through the BAT pin, but the Itsy Bitsy doesn't provide any LiPo charging capability. The Itsy Bitsy can auto switch between the USB connection and the battery power, which means you could create some sort of UPS if you needed that in your projects. And the USB pin provides five volts directly from the USB connector, there is a reset pin and two 3.3 volts output pins from the onboard regulator which is capable of providing about 500 milliamps at peak. The VHI pin, or the VHI pin, 
provides the higher of the two voltages between USB or BAT. So this is usually 5 volts when powered over USB, but can swing between 3.6 and 6 volts when powered by VBAT, depending on the charge of your battery. And this pin is not regulated, and so is capable of quite high current. There are 23 GPIO pins, 4 of them are capable of ADC inputs, 16 are capable of PWM outputs, and there are 10 consecutive digital pins for PIO compatibility. The SWD, or Serial Wire Debug Pins, are broken out to allow easy debugging compared to the feather, which leaves it as sort of an unsoldered header, which you have to then buy and solder on yourself. Well, this means that this board could be quite useful in a small form factor debugger like a Pico Probe. I have a video of that as well. One of the digital pins is actually stepped up to the V high voltage, which is usually 5 volts, as discussed earlier and can be used for directly controlling um, 5 volt logic devices without having to use a level shifter. This pin is actually mislabeled on my board, so if you have one of the early batches of these boards, this pin might be labelled as GPIO 16, but it should actually be GPIO 14. But this pin is clearly labelled as a V-high pin um, regardless. Just make sure you don't tie it to a board that <laughs> can only take um, a 3.3 volt input. There is no stemmer QT connector, which I don't personally miss, um, but because I prefer the pins being broken out, but I know that some people may miss it. It is the only board of the three today that we're looking at lacking this connector. So I think that covers most of the main features that are on the board, and now some of my thoughts for those that are interested. Let's start with the silk screen on the top and the rear of the board. This is underestimated in reviews, and even though there isn't much space on the top of the board, Adafruit has managed to put silkscreen pin labels on the top. I never really noticed or thought about how important this was until I used the Raspberry Pi Pico in a breadboard and had absolutely no clue what pin does what, uh, as it only has pin labels on the bottom. I like the form factor of this board. It is small and one-sided, uh, meant for small spaces with more pinouts or pin requirements than the QtPi RP2040. I think as a single-sided board, castellated pins would have made a lot of sense in this product for embedding this on small carrier PCBs, so that's a bit of a shame that this hasn't been considered. I am a big hater of micro USB, so it is a bit of a shame that USB-C is not present where both the QtPi and the Feather have USB-C, so it would have been nice. But I think that some people will actually welcome the micro USB in height constrained projects. I just have some durability concerns with the micro USB connector. The user buttons too also aren't fantastic and a bit challenging to press actually because the actual button bit is tiny. Uh, but that's certainly not a big deal and maybe I just have fat fingers. So although I've just ragged on this board for the past <laughs> couple of minutes, I think that overall it is a good choice for those space constrained projects that require more pins than the QtPi RP2040, but where you can't squeeze in a feather board. But let me know what you think. Thank you very much for watching, I hope you found this interesting. Let us know what you think of the Itsy Bitsy RP2040 down in the comments below. Please like the video if you enjoyed it and consider subscribing for more. Thank you and as always, have a nice day.